Join me every month for the inspiration to find your finish line. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Find Your Finish Line, presented by Activice, the official topical pain relief partner of Ironman. I'm Mike Riley, your host, and this podcast is not only about you being able to find your finish line at an event or a race, but also in life. We have to find finish lines every day, don't we? I'll talk with successful people from all backgrounds, all walks of life, about their inspiring stories of struggle and achievement in sports and in life. So now it's time to welcome our guest today. There she is, Marinda Carfrey. Hello, mm-hmm. Rennie. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Very, very well. Thank you. And and welcome to Find Your Finish Line. I know your days are jam-packed, so we appreciate your, your time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had to peel myself away from the little guy and... Tim's up on daddy day- daycare right now, so we'll we'll see how we go. Yeah, just just send a message to Tim. You'll only be on for a couple hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Rennie, she's learning. affectionately known as Rennie, the mom of two, Izzy and Finn, uh, been on that podium in Kona seven times and still the course record holder. Uh, Rennie, I tell you what, it's also great following your comeback after baby number two of getting back into training. And we're going to talk about that. But I want to go back when you were playing basketball in Australia. That's that's your love. That's your passion. Uh, mine's baseball, but we're in the triathlon world. Mm-hmm. And uh, But all of a sudden, you made that transition over. Can you take us through when you did your very first triathlon? I think you were like 19 years old. Yeah, exactly. I was, um, yeah, 18 or 19. And I was a basketball player. I played basketball from when I was seven to 18 and I met a couple of triathletes at the gym and just was intrigued by the sport. You know, even though Australia was dominating in triathlon, I was really just in the, never paid attention to the endurance sports world. I was so like focused on playing basketball and, um, I kind of was like, what you guys do three sports. This is crazy. (laughs) And, um, I did my first race. It was about a 300 yard swim, I think like a six mile bike and like a two mile maybe run. And man, it was like ridiculously hard. I remember just being in the swim. Like I wasn't a swimmer, cyclist or runner. I was okay at running. Um, I got roped into doing a lot of running events for my school, but I never enjoyed it. And I never, it was something that I thought I would be doing for a living. Certainly, (laughs) certainly. But yeah, I remember just like being beat up in the swim and then like being so winded, trying to hop on the bike and ride my bike. And just feeling pain the whole whole race. Um, and this is think just thinking, this is the work. Like, why would anyone want to do this? This is so stupid. And then I finished finished the race and I ended up third overall. And so all of a sudden I'm like, huh, well, I can do better than that. You know, and then, you know, as you know, the the bug had had got me. And um, yeah, almost over 20 years later, I'm still racing. Still racing, still, and you know, it, it, it's amazing how time flies like that. There's so many out there that uh, so many of us talk to that are getting to triathlon for the first time and want to do their first event. What was that one thing that you struggled with during that first try and you push yourself through? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> From like just being uncomfortable being in the open water. Like I think that that's like a big part of racing for many athletes because we, we don't go swim you know we go play in yeah. maybe in water that's clear but this was murky water and um you know I wasn't really a swimmer and you know I could swim to save myself but that was uncomfortable the whole race was completely out of my comfort zone and um yeah like taking that leap to actually go and do the race I think is the best obviously is the best thing I ever did in my life um and yeah, I mean, uncomfortable on the bike, like learning the whole thing. There's so much going on in a triathlon, um, you know, the transitions, getting, <laughs> trying to get all the little things right. And then, yeah, just being pretty uncomfortable. Thankful that I made it to the run, but also, you know, feeling like my legs were bricks um, running off the bike. Well, it's amazing how many times I've heard if you leave your comfort zone, new horizons open up and definitely an unbelievable 20-year horizon <laughs> has opened up for yeah. you. Uh, so being a mom, we've heard so many things. Oh my gosh, I think I'm faster because I had uh, a couple children. Uh, my recovery time is a little different, but it's working out well. 
there's a lot of moms out there who want to dip their toes in triathlon, who want to stay in shape or get back in shape. Uh, what do you think the best advice you can give them? Because there's so few hours in the day now with one or two or three children. What, what kind of advice could you give the moms out there? Yeah, I mean, first of all, congrats on your new family. <laughs> It's, it's amazing how priorities shift, um, you know, prior to having our children, we were all about triathlon and I still love the sport, but they're my number one priority, you know, family and our kids are our number one priority. Um, but we do love and have a passion for this sport. So we're continuing to race. We're choosing to continue to race, um, into our twilight years, I, I'll say. Uh, but I think the most important thing to remember is to, you know, go easy on yourself, you know, like all of a sudden you've got little ones needing you and, um, wanting your attention all the time. And there's not so many, only so many hours in the day. So prioritize one piece of advice to prioritize training quality over quantity. Uh, definitely look at the sessions that are most important in your week. And if, if you have to miss a session, sometimes you have to miss a session. Um, but make sure you get those quality ones, the most bang for your buck sessions in, uh, because it is my job. I, Try, I get all of my sessions in at some way <laughs> or another, but that's, you know, I, I'm basically mum and then I'm triathlete and a lot of these mums are mum, you know, they have, you know, jobs and then triathlete as well. So there's only so many hours in the day and I think you know, go easy on yourself is, is what I would say. I, I like it. It's great advice. Great advice for everybody because I think so many times, so many people in the sport just all of a sudden, if that training session doesn't happen, they like freak out. They, they, they're they very hard on themselves, which in the end, I think just slows you down. Was it harder to get back into the game, get back into training after your second child and your first? Was there any difference or expectations that you go, whoa, this is a little different here or it's the same or better? You know, I never thought I would continue on racing after having a child. And then, you know, I got to, yeah. you know, 35, 36 years old. And I was like, well, I still love racing. I still love this sport, but I'm ready to have start a family. I'm not getting any younger. And so we made the decision to have Izzy and then coming back from Izzy, I had, um, you know, I had my own expectations, but then, you know, there are also outside expectations, but I think the ones that you put on yourself are the most important. And, um, yeah, I was very pleasantly surprised with how well I came back from having Isabel. I did my first race seven months after having Izzy, which, you know, some try like Michelle Vesteby, um, Meredith Kessler, a couple other women who have come back in four months or, or five months and done an Ironman, which I, I don't know how that I couldn't do that. <laughs> that is very impressive and the talent in itself. But, um, yeah, it's about seven months when I did my first race after Izzy, I did Texas 70.3 and I biked as well, if not better than I ever have before and ended up second in that race against, um, I think, um, Mel Howshield, who was a three times 70.3 world champion beat me that day. And, I was pleasantly surprised because looking at the training that I'd done, I was hoping, you know, I wouldn't, you know, being um, bashful when I, before the race said I'd be great to get in the top 10 because uh, I really didn't think my fitness was there yet. But, um, yeah, I think when the gun goes off, you have your instincts, but also there's a little bit of mum strength that comes in, comes with um, having a baby, like having your little one on a little cheerleader that's, you know, not even two feet tall. Um, just gives you some extra strength to get to that finish line for, you know, finish line snuggles. And, and this time around, honestly, can't really tell you yet. I feel like my body felt like I was able to get back to training or, you know, at least start back to training a little quicker than it was with Izzy. Like the bounce back seemed a, a little quicker, but I really haven't, I know I'm only really at 50% of um, my full training load at the moment. Uh, she's sorry. He's um, not even four months old. Mm -hmm. so I think give me another month or two and I'll be able to tell you like the real differences between the two, like after the first one and after the second one. But, um, you know, so far so good. I feel like training is coming along well. Um, the fun thing when you do come back from being that out of shape is that the gains are quick. So weekly I'm seeing mm -hmm. improvements. I'm like, Oh, now I can swim, you know, on the one thirty. last week I could barely, you know, two weeks ago, I could barely make one forty cycle. Um, you know, Running has been a little slower because we're being cautious. I've, I'm up about almost 20 pounds on my race weight and I'm not worried at all whatsoever, but, you know, you can't really just 
crank the the run volume when you're a little heavier and it feels awful to be carrying weight um and and running so we're going pretty conservative with that but my cycling is is bouncing back really quickly too so um i'm excited for the next two months to see how i progress and then i'll be able to give you a quick clear answer Okay, so are we, and I love the the mom power. I, I have witnessed it at finish lines, like you mentioned, with Meredith or Rachel Joyce, and and uh, there's something about the aura of you coming across the finish line after being a mom, and and your little ones there. It's the most precious thing in the world. So that has to switch something mentally than before when you were having kids, even though you're world champion and everything. But mentally, it's got to ease. I don't know, ease the pressure or ease the thinking about, oh my gosh, if I don't do this, what'll happen? Because you do have that child and or children and and uh, it's, it probably switches that mental capacity to accept things much more easily, doesn't it? Absolutely. I think there's two things that happens there. Like one is that you are going to get the absolute most out of yourself in that race because you're taking time away from your little ones. Um, and even in training, you know, like every day when you go and do a training session, it's bang for buck. It is, you will crush yourself in that session, get the work done and then go back and play with them. Having them there for you at the finish line Mm -hmm. is it's so it's, it's, there's nothing more motivating than having, you know, your little person and also just wanting to be a good role model. Like knowing that they're there watching you every step of the way, even though right now my kids are very little and may not really remember mum triathlete when they, when they get, grow up, you still want to put your best foot forward, um, show them, you know, if you're winning, losing, whatever, you're still out there giving your best and, and putting your best foot forward. And yeah, that's something I really sometimes think about, um, you know, when times get tough in races. Yeah, and I obviously I'm not the caliber of athlete that that you are, but I'll never forget running the Long Beach Marathon. Uh, my daughter Erin was probably, and Rose was there, Mom was there. Erin uh, was probably six or seven, and I remember coming around around the twenty mile point where they were going to meet and high fived Erin and yelled at her, and she was yelling "Daddy," and and I said something to her not long ago. Remember that time in Long when I? She goes, "No, I don't remember that." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> here was such a precious time for me. I, Oh, okay. Yeah. But uh, I, I know what you mean by that. When you're coming through and seeing the kids, it just, it fills your heart with joy. Absolutely. What about, what about, you know, recovery time? Recovery is obviously one of the biggest things there is about doing triathlon and during sports. You have to recover. Your recovery has got to be a little different now with two little ones after you get done with a race. Well, Izzy, you know, you get done with a race and you had her, but what do you do for recovery? Uh, honestly, after a race, it's not the problem. It's the day-to-day recovery that's the toughest. You know, after a race, we, you know, take time as a family. Hopefully, Tim's also done the race. So, you know, I'm the queen of taking downtime and taking time off. I think that's why I've had such great um, longevity in the sport. I'm not afraid to take a few days off after a, a big event and let it, you know, soak in and, and also just, you know, s- spend some time to ourselves. Um, so I really look forward to that downtime after the race. I mean, obviously immediately after race, you got your little one, she's jumping all over you, you're, but <laughs> who cares? Like you finish the race, you know, your legs hurt, but whatever, um, you get to spend a couple of days just with the family. Uh, it's the, really the day to day, like coming home from training and having, you know, Izzy wants to run around, um, or you, you have to play horsey. She wants to ride on your back or <laughs> you want to go, she wants to go play out in the, you know, we have a master's bar in our backyard. So play out in the master's bar. I mean, and it's, it's lovely to get in there, but I've just in the pool. I don't want to go back in the pool again, but you know, you do it because, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, time with them is more important than anything else. So on relaxing time, let me, do you relax with, you know, say if the kids aren't around or they're napping or whatever with a book, Netflix, uh, wine, mm-hmm. taking a nap? What do, what do you do? Honestly, I, um, well, you know, my husband and I, is no secret, we like our wine. So yeah. we do enjoy a glass or two with dinner most nights. But um, yeah, I actually take a nap with the kids at lunchtime. So that's my uh, like go. secret weapon. I, from when Finn was born, um, I would... And I didn't know if this was going to work because Izzy's like at that age, she's three and a half. She doesn't really want to nap anymore. But if I hop into bed and say, you can hop into bed with Finn and I, then she'll nap. And so like every day at like 1.30, we lock the house down and Izzy and myself and Finn, Tim's not really a napper, so he just gets work done on the computer, but um, he gets 
space from the like quiet time for himself. Mm-hmm. And I take in that with the kids and, um, yeah, honestly, it's saving me. Hold on, everyone. We'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. As an endurance athlete, you're constantly pushing your body to new limits, searching for your personal best for the next finish line. If you're training for an endurance event, whether short distance or long distance, proper recovery is the key to you unlocking your potential. As the official topical pain relief partner for the Ironman US series, Activice's lineup of topical cooling gel, roll-on and spray features 8% menthol and eucalyptus oil to provide the instant icy relief you need to recover smarter and faster. The water-based, non-sticky formula withstands sweat to keep up with the demands and exertion of race day. Don't let muscle pain or sprains hold you back from reaching your potential, from reaching your personal best. Shop the Activices lineup on Amazon today for the support you need to find your finish line. Where do you tell us where you think... I, because I've, I've been around you in situations where I can tell there's a serious inner fire to compete and to win, uh, which you, you have to have. Where, where do you think that came from? Do you remember it clicking on one day or one race and going, you know what? I am not going to be friggin' beat here. I mm-hmm. mean, you, you have to have that fire. Uh, have you always had it or is it something where all of a sudden you realize, man, there it is. I'm going to I'm going to do this. No, I think it's something that I've always had, like just that competitive drive. I mean, I'm one of six kids. I have, um, you know, that helps three brothers, two sisters, but boys all around me. So, and we grew up on a farm, so my brothers were never easy on me. Uh, you know, the next two in line are both boys and, and they were pretty tough on me. They never let me win anything. And so, um, yeah, I just remember, you know, even through playing basketball. I was always the fittest on the team. I always did the extra sessions. I always was, you know, I'd get the, you know, the fitness program for ba- the basketball team for the upcoming season. And I would actually do the program wow. and, um, you know, most kids wouldn't even, you know, they'd kind of get it and throw it out the window, but I would, you know, make my mom come out and time me to do 100 sprints or something. I mean, I had no, no idea about any training, um, you know, what to do, but I had a piece of paper that said, do this three times a week. So I did it three times a week. And, um, you know, once I came to triathlon, I really figured out how to use that competitive nature in the triathlon setting in a basketball setting. It was a lot harder and I got overlooked a lot cause I was, you know, I'm five, three. So maybe I had a chip on my shoulder coming into triathlon yeah. and a point to prove. Um, but yeah, I think, I think I've always had it. I got a feeling you were the fastest one on the court. So the, the heck with 5'3", huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. I had to be quick. If I wasn't going to be big, I had to be quick. So Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'm going to switch it just a little bit. Uh, what's going on right now with uh, the diversity and, you know, men's and women's dynamics and roles or in the workplace and sport and life or, you know, the being re calibrated, redefined more now than ever, but in a good way. Uh, Talk to us about how you feel our sport and the businesses of our sport are doing. You know, what kind of grade would you give triathlon in that in that arena? You know, I think triathlon hasn't been a diverse sport um, historically, but I think with Ironman reaching um, new areas of the world, I think that that has brought in diversity. Um, you know, more races in China, Asia Pacific, um, and. And I think in the last few years in particular, there's been real a real push to bring more diversity into the sport. And mm-hmm. it's slowly happening. I think it's something that's going to happen over time. And and obviously, you know, triathlon is an expensive sport. It's, um, you know, bike equipment, um, even running shoes, um, you know, all of these caps, you know, goggles. There's so many things you need to do a triathlon. So uh, that's something that needs to be looked at if we want – you know, more diversity or bringing more keep to continue to bring more diversity into the sport. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, triathlon has recognized that or Ironman has recognized that and they're, um, at least making steps to, to go down the path of, um, funding and, um, helping, you know, minorities get the chance to do a triathlon because it is a wonderful sport and, and should be shared amongst everyone or anyone who, who would like to do it. 
Yeah, and we've we've seen it over and over again where when someone does come into the sport, it's uh, it's religion. I mean, they oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing I've it's ever life-changing. done. It's life changing. Yeah. Yeah, you've you've seen people's they come back to the finish lines at, at Ironmans or in Kona or challenge any race, and you see the the expressions and the look on the face and the passion. You go, oh my gosh, it, we're watching lives change right in front of us. Uh, it's just a matter of that first step of getting getting them in. So mm-hmm. hopefully, we keep doing a great job of, of trying to do that. What, by the way, what I, I I haven't seen it anywhere, and I, we didn't talk about it earlier, but. What is your next event? Do you, have you published it? Or are you going to talk about it? Or you know, where are you going to compete? <laughs> exactly. I like ideally would love to find a race in July, but I'm looking at the calendar and there's a lot of races in June and not really that many options in July in the US. Um, I probably, I'm not sure if we could travel. I know there's a race in Europe in July, but I'm not sure that we would um, be able to travel to Europe and I don't know if I want to take the whole the whole family yeah. just yet yeah. on, on the road. Um, but yeah, I'm looking for a race in July. I have not picked anything out yet. Uh, you know, if not July, then late June, uh, I'll try and start. But I'm going to get my butt kicked, I think, in that first <laughs> first race. Um, but you know, you got to make that first step. And um, yeah, probably by August September, I should be in pretty good shape. I'm hoping to have some great performances through then. But We've left it up in the air. I kind of haven't really even spoken to my coach much. We kind of vaguely have spoken, okay, well, let's see how we're going and, you know, this could be a good time frame. But, um, you know, I have Kona. I have my spot for Kona um, Mm -hmm. on the horizon and uh, I will be on that start line if I feel that I've I've got enough fitness and I'm in – shape enough to compete at the top level. If we don't, then we might shift our focus and do an Ironman, you know, around, you know, late, maybe a month later and try and qualify for 22 Kona. 22, because, yeah. So, so you're, you'd be, you'd be just keen on 70.3, wouldn't you? Yeah. Keen on 70.3, but definitely want to do an Ironman by the end of the year. So whether that's Kona, if, oh, you know, if I bounce back in two months and feeling great and feel like I can compete in Kona, then I'll, I'll be there racing. Uh, if I don't, then I, I don't think there's any point in, in going to Kona and, and going around the course, I've, I'm I'm not a spectator anymore. I've done that. I've done that race uh, <laughs> a, a bunch of times. I, I only want to go there if I can be a competitor. Well, you said something the other day, and I saw it. I, I thought it was beautiful. It says, "You didn't come this far only to come this far." How does Marinda Carfrey know how far is for herself? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, I just think that there's there's always more. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned, I'm getting older in the sport, but I, I don't think there's any reason why I couldn't go as fast, if not fast, that I have before. I, I see what the girls are doing and it's impressive. Uh, Daniela and um, Annie Haag, what they've been mm-hmm. doing the last few years, but I, th- I think I can get up on that level and um, yeah, time will tell. But um, I think I've got, you know, at least one more good Kona in me, maybe two. And then, and then we'll, we'll call I, it quits. <laughs> then we'll move uh, okay, on. Okay. Out okay. To I, I have to <laughs> recollect when you ran the 250 in Kona, I was at the finish line of the Jumbotron trying to announce what was going on. And then I, I said, there's nothing needs to be said. We were watching you run like a gazelle. I just, and, and uh, that's the fastest I've ever run a marathon. I'm thinking, no, wait a minute. She's just coming off. They, they take us through that, especially when you got close to town, because every inch of the road there is historic. We all know it, and we've seen people before us go over it, good and bad. Uh, but that had to be almost like walking on air. Yeah, that was um, pretty incredible. I mean, 2014, that was my third um, world title, so my sixth time racing in Kona, and so I, I knew exactly what I was in for. I you know, know, knew every inch of that course, as, as you mm-hmm. say, and, and it it gives me kind of all the feels right now, you know, like goosebumps, uh, that excitement to, to be in that moment. Um, uh, you know, I have memories to last a lifetime on that big island, and um, that definitely is a special one, uh, you know basically coming from 14 minutes down off the bike, you know, it's been well documented at this point, but you know, that far down thinking at the start of the run that like, you know, I'm defending champion, I'm 14 minutes down, this is an embarrassment. 
to, okay, switching my mindset around um, to, okay, well, let's see. I think I was in eighth or ninth position. Let's try and get in the top five, at least try and get in the top five. And so, you know, then I got into the top five, then I was in the top three and all of a sudden the attitude was positive. Like, okay, this is a great day. Like I can maybe have my fastest ever marathon um, here today. And, and, and then, yeah, Daniela was just up the road there and I was able to pick her off, you know, a few, few K from the finish um, in her first race in, in Kona. Uh, I remember running past Rachel Joyce and saying, we can't let a rookie win. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, fortunately I had, you know, strong enough legs to, to get the job done that day. And yeah, running down, you know, Polani down the Lee drive. Yeah. As I mentioned, just memories to last a lifetime. Like there's, there's no other feeling like it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a special, special moment, special place. You know, they, they say that when we fail, we're not a failure because if we learn from that experience, you're not a failure. But what was something or an event or something in life that you really felt you failed at, but you learned the biggest lesson from? Um, well, the first one that came to mind there, I mean, I'm sure there's a ton, Mike. <laughs> the first one that came to mind there was back when I first started triathlon, um, I, and IT, I raced ITU and I was a terrible swimmer and ITU racing, you really need to be a good swimmer. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to be a good day. <laughs> and I remember, um, just getting out of the swim so far down and these are super swimmers. These are ex Olympic, you know, swimming mm -hmm. athletes crossing over to triathlon. So not really much shame in swimming that far behind them, but again, you know, you're a competitor, you want to be at the pointy of the field. And there was a multi-lap course, I think eight, eight laps of 5k and, um, they're probably three or 4k into the ride. And I was just hopping on my bike. And if you got lapped, then you are off mm. the course, they pull you off the course. And in that race, I was like, Oh, I'm going to get lapped. And I just remember giving up and that feeling of giving up and knowing I'd given up kind of was like, I'm never doing that again. Cause that was way worse than just putting it all out on the line, you know, and, um, doing your best and seeing what happened. And yeah, I think that is kind of one of the reasons that enabled me to be the athlete that I was like, just having that mm -hmm. lesson. Okay. Well, you know, you never want to give up, you know, you never want to give in, don't give like an inch, not, not a millimeter because, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be disappointed with yourself. And that disappointment, it runs deep, you know, like that, that, that hurts when you've given up and you know, you've given up. And so, um, yeah, I, I took that lesson into Ironman racing and, um, yeah, many races I've basically spent my whole career chasing. I'm not a good swimmer and no, that's no secret and good on the bike, still not the best in the world, but, um, good on the bike, but, um, yeah, I, I generally have a very strong run. So, that's where I succeed and spent every single well, race of my career chasing girls down. Sometimes hurts are, are the best medicine, huh? I mean, yeah. it's just, just amazing how people learn from that. Mm -hmm. Rennie, who? Yeah, I know, you know, obviously your, your kids inspire you, T.O. inspires you, but who? You, you have a mentor, somebody that inspires you or somebody you listen to and say, you know what, I've got to, or you need where I go, I got to call them up and I got to have a chat. Uh, you have someone like that in your life? I mean, I think there's my, my mom for sure. Uh, I think anyone would, you know, hopefully has a parent that they can call up and talk to about, you know, anything, but she's more on the, you know, bigger life things where mm -hmm. I'll bounce ideas off or I'll bounce thoughts of her. But my mentor was, is Siri Lindley. Um, you know, I start working with her in 05 and um, she, you know, coached me through three world title, four world titles with my 70.3 world title. And, um, yeah, she's just a phenomenal person, woman, um, in, in, incredible positive being. And yeah, I think, she, yeah, she's definitely the one that I'll be calling up. Um, you know, she's not my coach anymore. Julie Dibbins my coach now. Um, but yeah, if she's, she's kind of the one that I, would probably turn to if I needed, you know, some serious advice on the racing front. Or Every time I talk to her, I get off the phone feeling like I'm on cloud nine. Yeah. It's just something about her infectious, uh, positive behavior that, gosh, you wish you could just throw it around everybody in the world because it'd be a better place just to have the Siri attitude, you know? <laughs> yeah, just bottle it up. I had, I basically had 15 years of that, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. that energy behind me and, and that, you know, that, 
that goes a long way. You know, having that positivity in your corner is, is pretty incredible. What do you, what do you want to leave behind for the sport? So to speak, a, a gift from Rennie. Have you ever thought about that? Um, I think, you know, you know, you, once you're past your prime and you, and you retire, there's only few athletes that stick out in mind, you know, like, you know, the Dave Scott, Mark Allen, the newbie Fraser, Natasha Badman sticks out to me uh, just as someone who just brought such joy to racing and being <laughs> able to compete. Um, I think for me, maybe th- people will think about, you know, being persistent and perseverance, um, you know, but who knows, <laughs> you know, I hope that people, you know, look at my body of work or my racing career and, and see an athlete that just never gave up. And, and that's kind of, you know, how I raced. Uh, yes, there's no doubt about that. I've got one final question. It's called tri-table racing, how we reminisce about a memory of a race. But before we do that, I've got to go into the Aussie slang. You know, I go went over to Australia years ago, announced that race for many years, and they started talking to me, and I didn't know what the hell they were talking <laughs> about. So w- what's a cobber? A cobber? I think cobber is – I haven't been, lived in Australia for a long time, but cobber is just like a bloke, like a cobber. Yeah, a friend. That's right. Guy, yeah. friend. I always remember that. Now, the other one was uh, Chock-A-Block, which... I, yeah, it's full. I, I, yeah, I got a drink at a bar. It was a margarita there. And uh, the mate sitting next to me, go, that's a Chock-A-Block drink. And I'm thinking, I thought I got a margarita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, and then it somebody miss it. Mm-hmm. It was, who was it? Oh, Ken Baggs goes, he kept saying fair dinkum every time I was telling him something. And I go... What is there a fair in town? <laughs> the, the fair dinkum is like really or honestly or you know yeah. like we say really. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's um, yeah. I there's a lot of slang and you forget. <laughs> um, I you know I haven't heard those words in a, in a while. Mike, my, my brother's pretty, Oka Australian, which like yeah. he he has a lot of slang and um yeah, I, it's fun to talk to him <laughs> when we go the, home. The and it's I actually is... fun for for Tim more than me. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> The other one is uh, uh, we were at the it was it was the next day after the race and we were going to the after party and somebody said come on we're gonna go piss up and I'm going what what I, I gotta go pee somewhere what <laughs> <laughs> the piss up was like a party or get yeah. together I'm going where do you get party and get together piss. from pissing I don't get it <laughs> piss up piss up is like getting pissed so drink getting drunk is getting pissed yeah. so let's go. Yeah piss up yeah I, yeah that's that's what yeah there's many <laughs> we can go for so, hours here mike <laughs> I, I know it's just it's so many well the final question on find your finish line it's called tri-table racing and in the off-road racing world that like in baja 1000 they call it table racing where they sit around the table after the race and reminisce about the event uh, i call it tri-table racing so why don't you can you reminisce about the best last memory you had at your last race? The last race I did uh, was actually Cabo 70.3. So it's just any last race I did? Yeah. So just the last race. You know, a, a tidbit from if we're sitting around the table and go, you know what happened to me out there? <laughs> uh, there wasn't anything that exciting that happened to me in that last race that I did. Um, I actually, I won the race miraculously because I felt awful on the swim, bike, and run. But um, yeah, there's not like a special tidbit from, from, from that one, um, which was, you know, I didn't realize it's going to be my last, but COVID happened and then we decided yeah. to have a baby. <laughs> what, what about the funniest thing you've seen out there on a race course? Even when you're racing pro, you look at some go, are you kidding me? <laughs> well, th- probably the, f- the funniest was back when I did wildflower and there was the nude area. But <laughs> I didn't even know it existed. And you come around the corner and there's just all these nude guys like just cheering for you and i'm like oh, oh this is a little bit strange but okay like this this is fine with me <laughs> it, it's part of the race yeah <laughs> yeah that was well that is it, it's been so much fun having you on and and we have been going through obviously a tough 14 to 16 months if there's any advice you can give to all those age groupers out there who like you want to get back to mm-hmm. what our love is of, of racing and get back to the events. What advice could you give them? Well, I mean, I think everyone it's been said, but you know, races will return. Um, the world will, um, 
you know, keep turning and yeah, I think just, you know, keep getting out there. Uh, the sport is more than you know, just the race. It's about camaraderie. It's about friendships. It's about training partners. And, um, yeah, I think you can have a really, you know, fun time just doing great training sessions with, with your friends or, or planning a really great, you know, training weekend, uh, that could be instead of a race, if you can't get to a race yet, or if your local race gets canceled, then, um, you definitely, you know, some of my best memories are from training. Um, yeah. you don't get the glory, but, um, yeah, definitely have some really special memories of training with Julie and, uh, Crowey and, um, and, and Greg Bennett and Laura Bennett and, you know, some of my greatest friendships have come from just training. From training. Well, fantastic words. Thank you again for your time. I know your day is, uh, you can go relieve Tim now or tell him he's got another hour because I said he had to do that or something like that. You know, I might sneak out <laughs> the back door and yeah. go, go down the, down yeah. the yeah. road for Get a, a drink. quick 30 minute run in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Rennie. Have yourself a fantastic day and I cannot wait to see you at the next event. Yeah. I can't wait to see you too, Mike. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you, everybody, for joining Find Your Finish Line, presented by Activice, the official topical pain relief of Ironman. By the way, if you like this episode and you want to sign up or subscribe to become notified of upcoming shows, you can do that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, or right from our website, MikeRiley.net. Hey, keep in mind, there's always things in life and racing that don't go our way, that we don't have control over. But we do have control over one thing, our attitude. If we keep it positive and take care of it, it will take care of us and get you to the finish line. Have a strong day, everybody. Take care of yourselves out there. And as always, I'm Mike Riley, wishing you the warmest aloha.